Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Jim Chandler. I'm the director of the Frankie Institute, which is the sponsor of this Humanities Forum series here at the Gleacher three times a year. This is our last for this year. We're very glad to have Elaine Hadley here today, and here to make a proper introduction for Elaine is the George M. Pullman Professor of English at the University of Chicago, Lauren Berlant. Lauren? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm so glad that people have shown up on such a beautiful day uh, for what will be, I know, a really wonderful talk. Um, I spent the morning reading Elaine's books and then found out that she's going to talk about them in the talk. So like my book report, which I dutifully wrote to show you that I knew what the books were about and things like that, uh, uh, has turned out to be a little bit irrelevant. But I then thought, oh, good, I get to go anecdotal now. So um, well, once I gave a lecture at the University of Chicago and Elaine introduced me, and she said, she told a story in the beginning of it about a mother, a daughter asking a mother something. I have no idea what the content of this was because I was too nervous. And my, you know how your head gets full of noise when you're nervous. I don't know if you've ever been nervous, but you could ask somebody later. So my, so she, anyway, the daughter asked the mother something and then the mother told the daughter something. And the thing I thought about it was that Elaine is always interested in the relation between the transmission of knowledge and the transmission of affect. What is it, how is it that we know something? And what's the relationship between the way we know something and the kind of feelings that get transmitted between people such that we're both knowing what we think we know and also a whole universe or a whole world that's being held up by what we know. So for example, let's think about impersonality or the desire to be impersonal. We could be objective in our opinions. We could be impersonal in our opinions. We could be disinterested in our opinions, which doesn't make any sense because if you have an opinion, that means you have an interest. But there's this idea that you could have a kind of judgment that was above appetites. You could have that. On the other hand, you could have a kind of disinterestedness that's a way of not caring about something. It's a way of kind of putting something off and saying, I don't have to become uh, uh, out of control in relation to that object. The, the relationship between the affective experience of being disinterested and actual disinterest, the, the relation between being impersonal and feeling impersonal has been central to the way that Elaine has thought about political emotions since for both of her books. Her first book was called Melodramatic Tactics, Theatricalized Descent in England's Marketplace, 1880 to 1885, and it won the MLA's award for the, the, the best first book. This is a really fantastic book, and it tells the kind of prehistory of, or maybe just history of, I don't know why it has to be the present that really counts here, um, but you know, I'm, 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 I work on the present, so. It tells the prehistory of melodramatic politics and thinks about not just um, uh, theatrical melodrama, but the ways that politics became a space for melodramatic action, where melodramatic action was a scene um, where people were trying to figure out how not to let go of a world. So she, thought, she thinks of it as nostalgic, she thinks of it as conservative, but she also thinks of it as a kind of way of trying to resist the market, modern classification, and modern class antagonism. It's an incredibly interesting book. The second book, which is also about political affect, is it, it's about the cool side of politics rather than the hot side, you might say, although it's kind of cool passion rather than hot passion. And the, the cool side of politics, um, uh, she's interested in what we normally think of as liberalism, you know, opinion, self-reflectedness, disinterestedness, orientations toward thought, things like that. But what she wants to say about liberal personality isn't that it's just normal, but, and I'm quoting, it's an immensely creative response and frankly, immensely weird and taxing to be liberal. Nobody thinks that but Elaine. So I'm looking forward to today's rendition of what it means to be a liberal subject. Elaine Hadley. So thanks, Lauren. That I was looking forward to you making sense of my career, which you have, so I appreciate that. It's a hard thing for me to do. Um, and I wanted to thank Jim Chandler for inviting me and the Frankie Center in general and all the staff of the Frankie that's helped me get organized for this. And I also want to thank all of you today who've come, especially on a beautiful day like this where we all can imagine at least 20 other things we could be doing right now. Um, so it's a real pleasure to have a chance to share my work and my field of Victorian studies with an audience who are not already absorbed by its details. Some of you I know are, but most of you aren't who aren't, in a sense, card-carrying members of this peculiar club. Also, it proves to be a challenge. It seems imperative now more than ever to give an account of why there ought to be scholars in the humanities paid to do humanistic scholarship. It is not an unfair question to ask how my work on a different national culture in a period far, far away 
might be useful, informative, possibly delightful in some way, contributory to the people who sit before me. I had thought initially about doing a talk that grows out of a current project of mine on Victorian war, since, of course, war is still with us, and the challenges of representing war are still very much um, with us as well. But two days before I was asked to commit to a topic and title, my phone rang. It was Rasmussen polling, asking me to, quote, register my opinion on a wide range of issues, my favorite being, was the economy poor, below average, average, above average, good, or excellent? Lots of choices. And it convinced me that a return to a slightly earlier moment in my scholarship might be, in fact, more informative and useful to you, if not necessarily delightful. So this talk is about the seemingly most unremarkable of political categories, the opinion. I want to make it strange again, to probe it as if it were an alien being, because it was during that the period, that the, that, uh, the Victorian period, the political opinion as we know it, really took her hold. Emer I'm sorry, yes, emerging into the, the political domain very much like an alien, but quickly becoming the most common of ordinary things. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me start, as literary critics often do, with a series of images and a range of canonical Victorian texts. They produce a puzzle of associated meanings which I will try to unpack and which will lead me to, of all places, the balloting booth, and in the end, some questions and perhaps even a few answers about why we think about politics in certain ways, even to this day. I have four quotations to set before you. It will get me to my topic in a few minutes, but I also want to maximize this rare opportunity to share the vibrant prose of a period of literary history that is now increasingly little read, if, always, uh, if often put on masterpiece theater as plots, but you lose the sense of the prose in those cases. And I suspect that people are reading it less because they're seeing it more on the screen. But anyway, these bits of prose span the years 1854 to 1866, a period when much was going on in the British political scene, beginning with the emergence of the Liberal Party from the ashes of the old Tories, the new Peelites, and the diminished Whig Party, and culminating in the passage of the Second Reform Bill of 1867, which extended the franchise by another million men, but none of them rural laborers or women. I should perhaps say at the very beginning that the Victorian Liberal Party and Victorian liberalism more generally, should not be confused with a contemporary American sense of liberalism and liberals. There are genealogical continuities, to be sure, but not straightforwardly so. Mid-19th century liberalism was an ideology of free markets and thus committed to a significantly reduced government role in the economy compared to an earlier protectionist and mercantilist era, a policy of retrenchment that believed in reduced taxation if not always enacting it, with little interest in what we might call social services until much, much later in the century, the Liberal Party was fueled by its commitment to the science of political economy, what we now call in its inherited form economics, which by the middle of the 19th century had become a holy grail of sorts. In many respects, Victorian liberalism is more like the libertarian strain of the current Republican Party. But as I will suggest, mid-Victorian liberalism was also increasingly the theorist and champion of opinion as a political force. And this understanding of opinion was in fact a powerful innovation of the period. At the very beginning of this liberalizing period, we have Charles Dickens, who else, right? Writing what is now a very much quoted passage from his novel, Hard Times of 1854. It is an astonishing piece of writing that introduces us to the industrial city of Coketown with what often seems to be a cinematic sweep of rhetoric. It was a town of machinery and tall chimneys out of which interminable serpents of smoke trailed themselves forever and ever and never got uncoiled. It had a black canal in it and a river that ran purple with ill-smelling dye and vast piles of buildings full of windows where there was a rattling and a trembling all day long, and where the piston of the steam engine worked monotonously up and down like the head of an elephant in a state of melancholy madness. It contained several large streets, all very like one another, 
and many small streets still more like one another, inhabited by people equally like one another, who all went in and out at the same hours, with the same sound upon the same payments, to the same work, and to whom every day was the same as yesterday, and tomorrow, and every year the counterpart of the last and the next. So much, so very much to say about this passage, but let me just emphasize two observations briefly for now. First, note how machinery, in particular the steam engine, is foregrounded as landmark, which countenances a syntax of repetition and thereby a critique of the monotony of mass production in general, the mass production of iron, of company domiciles, and of workers. This passage is very typical of Dickens, as its expressive brilliance compels outrage for an ever-enlarging target. Dickens has become famous, and mostly rightly so, for this very capacity of eloquent outrage, which seems to show the interconnections at work in a complex social domain. However, at the time, gauged as a form of political analysis, it was also, and mostly rightly so, deemed suspect. The more one learns the details of any given social ill Dickens attacks, the more one realizes that Walter Badgett, journalist extraordinaire, and perhaps the pithiest of Victorian curmudgeons, is not unfair when he says thus of Dickens. He is often troubled with the idea that he must reflect, and his reflections are perhaps the worst reading in the world. But I cite this mostly because I love its deflationary flair. Let me get back to Dickens. My second observation is this. This novel, widely read and cited by contemporaries, and even quoted as actual evidence in a parliamentary debate concerning the factory conditions of the day, tapped into a very deep but also very clotted ensemble of assumptions about the significance of machinery in the Victorian period. Just a few years later, perhaps consciously repurposing this Dickens motif, John Stuart Mill, in what seems at first a completely different line of analysis, reinvokes the steam engine that had repetitively ground out the days and lives of Coketown. In On Liberty, Mill makes his passionate political case for the power of individual liberty. Not any liberty, of course, but the liberty expressed by individuals of character. He writes, a person whose desires and impulses are his own, are the expression of his own nature as it has been developed and modified by his own culture, is said to have a character. One whose desires and impulses are not his own has no character, no more than a steam engine has a character. Here, too, another very famous passage. This one has long been seen to do, rather tersely, the significant task of sharply revising the utilitarian philosophy of Mill's father, James, and his close friend, Jeremy Bentham. In short, a man and men and moss are not to be valued in terms of just any pleasures and pains, as Bentham's hedonistic calculus seemed to insist, but in terms of the pleasures and pains that grow from that most complex and pervasive category of the Victorian period, character. Again, so much I could say about this passage, but for my purposes, I want to highlight one aspect. When put alongside the passage from Hard Times, this passage contributes to an emergent conceptual binary of the period. Machinery and the steam engine seem aligned with mass production, with the replication of quantity rather than the refinement of quality, the mechanical generation of people as units or products rather than the cultivation of individuals with character. Note here that character, for Mill, denotes a form of self-possession an owning of desires and impulses that not only evokes the self-possession of personal restraint, but also the self-possession that makes a person a character. Simply put, a being in possession of a self. Just a few years after Mill's Libertarian Manifesto in 1866, and certainly suffused with its prose, George Eliot wrote her lesser-known political novel, Felix Holt an attempt to join the debate concerning the extension of the franchise to working men. She carries on the chain of associations among engines, machinery, and character, but locates it squarely within, political, with, within politics proper. Her strapping, ruggedly handsome protagonist, Felix, has drawn a crowd around him in a pub where he opines about the political planks that have long defined the radical platform in British politics. Not a stereotypical working man, crazy for change, 
Felix voices instead a descant gradualist position that raises serious concerns about universal suffrage. He does so by turning to, of all things, a milk can and a steam engine. This is Felix speaking. The men who have had true thoughts about water and what will it do when it's turned into steam and under all sorts of circumstances have made themselves a great power in the world. They are turning the wheels of engines that will help to change most things, but no engines would have done if there had been false notions about the way water would act. Now, all the schemes about voting and the water or steam, the force that, it is, to, that is to work them, must come out of human nature, out of men's passions, feelings, desires. Whether the engines will do good work or bad depends on these feelings. And if we have false expectations about men's characters, we are very much like the idiot who thinks he'll carry milk in a can without a bottom. In my opinion, the notions about what mere voting will do are very much of that sort. A lively, dense passage, which is so true for all of Eliot's prose, even when it voices the thoughts of a simple working man, these sentences of Felix record a deepening of the dynamics of machinery and character that the previous passages from Mill and Dickens had staged. Straightforwardly, if one can say that about Eliot's prose, Felix is saying that the schemes about voting are types of engines or machinery, that people mistakenly, indeed idiotically, imagine um, can change human nature itself, as the Bessemer process had changed brute nature into steel. Felix insists that the machinery of voting does not alter human nature. Rather, the vote is constrained and indeed shaped by the nature of human character. One must have knowledge of human nature, what he likens, oddly, to the, quote, true thoughts of water, in order to change people. I will return to this curious phrase, thoughts of water, in a few minutes. It reveals quite a bit. As Felix sermonizes in the presence of his rapt fellow working men, he suggests that men's feelings, passions, and desires dictate the output of machinery, not the other way around. Note how this echoes Mill's phrases concerning desires and impulses and aligns with its assumptions. Human nature is a powerful, natural force that no machine can alter. But alteration can occur when that force of passions, feelings, and desires is brought into self-possession in the form of a character, a decidedly unmechanical form of self-control. By the mid 19, by sorry, by the mid 1860s, it had become standard to refer to the ballot and the ballot booth, and the various forms of representations floated during this heady moment of franchise reform as machinery. More often than not, especially in the mouths of certain strand of Victorian, uh, certain strand of liberal thought, the phrase mere machinery, or in Felix's phrasing, mere voting, is more common. For Felix and for George Eliot, who is ventriloquized in this instance by Felix, and for Matthew Arnold a few years later, the machinery of the ballot had become of a piece with an industrialized world such that people invested a kind of magic in its transformative capacities, as they had also increasingly become besotted by other types of mechanical innovation occurring all around them. Matthew Arnold elegantly chastises Mr. John Bright, the influential radical orator, who Arnold says, this is Matthew Arnold's words, Mr. Bright always inclines to inculcate that faith in machinery to which, as we have seen, Englishmen are so prone and which has been the bane of middle-class liberalism. He leads his disciples to believe, what the Englishman is always too ready to believe, that the having a vote, like the having a large family, or a large business, or large muscles, has itself some edifying and perfecting effect upon human nature. The ballot was lacking, in Arnold's touchstone words, sweetness and light, hence his rather disingenuous comparison of it to the unseemliness of overpopulation, shopkeeper ambition, and masculine robustness, all of which were profoundly distasteful to him. The machinery of franchise reform, and in particular the ballot itself, were allied in Arnold's analysis with mass production, with quantification, with repetition, with monotony, and with the replication of enfranchised voters, machine generated, who, to mangle Mill's words, have desires and impulses not their own. 
In political debates, it never takes long to encounter the familiar specter of an unruly mob. But in the Victorian period, the mob had become mechanical. I haven't tried too hard at this point to render logical this impacted cluster of associations I've been tracking in these quotations. We begin with real machinery in a factory, which even within the pages of Hard Times itself becomes a synecdoche for wide-ranging cultural enemy. We move quickly to its association with the franchise, which was sometimes allied with actual mechanical instantiations of the ballot box, though only sometimes, and arrive without much ado at the metaphorical affiliation between machinery and the lack of character. I haven't tried to render it fully logical because it simply isn't logical. Like the serpents of smoke in Coketown, the line that delineates the Victorian analysis of the mechanical, quote, never got uncoiled. This cluster expresses the complicated ambivalence attached to machinery and indeed its relation to human nature in this era of technological and political innovation. Eliot, Arnold, and Felix are responding in part to the call for a secret ballot, part of the radical platform for decades, but in the 1860s becoming more and more a legislative possibility. It, in fact, was put into law in 1872, moving the parliamentary vote from an open declaration voiced by electors before a general public to a silent mark on a ballot slotted into a box at an indoor polling station. As Arnold implies, there were radical liberals who believed the secret ballot would induce a certain kind of voting. In effect, enjoin people to vote as individuals. In sharp contrast to the position articulated by Felix, John Bright genuinely supposed that secret balloting would guarantee that voters would be able to express their own opinions. In the open air, so the argument goes, this is sort of uh, uh, giving it a, a sense of the pro-ballot position. In the open air, so the argument goes, electors had been exposed to what was once considered utterly acceptable persuasion but was now called undue influence. Once the privilege afforded by status, these pressures exerted by aristocratic landlords and capitalists and other forces in the constituents' community were now deemed interference. In a balloting booth, undue influence could not circulate, so an elector was all alone with himself and his own opinions. So we are now somewhat elliptically at the moment when my stated topic, opinion, emerges in the very thick of ambivalence and uncertainty about how best to realize its promise in the political domain. For whether a liberal supported the secret ballot or not, all liberals sided with the thing called opinion that the ballot might or might not bring into being. The debate about the ballot and in turn about mechanization is in part a sign that something new and powerful and inscrutable had arrived. It might seem inscrutable to you as well, that I am suggesting that political opinion emerges at this mid-19th century moment like an alien to the planet of politics. But I am, in a way, suggesting that. Although, of course, persons had opinions before this moment, politics had not been organized around it. Historical change is never neat and rarely swift, but I will have to be messy and quick to make my point and get you home to dinner. Before the mid-19th century, British political energies had cohered around what historians have often called interests. City interests, country interests, Tory interests, Whig interests. I am less concerned here with the modifier than the noun, since the noun, interests, designates a whole system organized around traditional, regional, often organic, and certainly habitual commitments embedded in mostly geographic constituencies. Political representatives from these constituencies emerged as candidates representing an interest block. They were often the aristocrat of the region or his intimate proxy. The lord of the manor was perhaps implicit in this category of interest, but the particular person holding that title was less importantly determinative of that interest than the entire system the title implied. One can detect in political speeches of the time uh, during this, this political, the political seasons of this pre-Victorian era, the candidates rarely articulated positions designated as their own opinions, but forwarded instead affirmations of traditional values. 
Indeed, these speeches often varied very little, since the values altered little over time. These values were understood to be much larger than any given person, and much older than any given political moment, and much deeper than the surface shifts of political positions. Complexly affiliated with the actual long-term possession of land, interest politics favored a form of parliamentary politics marked by the maintenance of those interests, a status quo of governance. Candidates came and went, parliaments commenced and completed, with virtually no legislation forwarded or passed. The world we now know of candidates, defined by both their political opinions and the opinions of voters, and what's more, by the legislative changes those opinions were expected to occasion, takes a while to become the ordinary, unremarked thing it is today. In the years encapsulated by my four quotations, opinion politics had arrived, but Victorians were clearly neither sure what it was nor fully sanguine about its promise. At mid-century, as evidenced by the electoral reform that culminates in 1867, politics was becoming unyoked to the powerful values of land ownership and becoming more and more attached to persons individually. In an earlier era, the allegiance, uh, I'm sorry, in an earlier era, the, the individuality of a political agent mattered little as long as a candidate declared allegiance to an interest bloc. In the brave new world I am trying to describe, votes just as much as candidates were less about allegiance to interests and much more about the expression of an opinion that was understood to be individual and private, but which was also expected to have an impact in the world. One can see, I hope, why some liberals thought the ballot box a potentially miraculous machine. By protecting the individual from an outside world that was unevenly reformed, where aristocrats and other interest blocs still expected candidates and voters to publicly declare allegiance, the ballot booth would enable the voter to become the private individual with opinions that a liberalizing world required. No longer an instance of a collective interest, the voter was now an individual with opinions designated as his own. The individual in this instance, the concept of the individual in this instance, is a very loaded concept. It is key for many in this period, but not all, that the voter voices, the voter votes as a singular unit, a person, as in one man, one vote. It is also key, however, that the elector votes his singularity, that is, his individuality. For Mill and Eliot and a multitude of other liberals, it is vital that persons who vote vote as individuals, not as interest proxies. What's more, these individuals are differentiated as individual political beings by their distinctive opinions. One individual is different from another based on the difference between their opinions. Mill, in particular, placed a great deal of emphasis on the distinction between and among opinions, committed as he was to a society where minority opinion might not just exist, but exert its consequence. But it isn't even enough to have distinctive opinions. It is also vitally important to possess them in a particular way. This is why character appears with frequency in the quotations I have cited for you. One must have both forms of self-possession that Mill implied in that quotation, not just be a unique character, but a character also in control of impulses and passions. Hence, an individual is he who possesses opinions self-reflexively, self-restrainedly, and therefore thoughtfully. A true individual of character has the ability not simply to think, but to think about one's thought, a kind of detachment from desiring energies that enables, in the political sphere, what Victorian liberals like to label disinterestedness. It is a perfect formulation, this disinterestedness, since it literally spells the distance from the interest politics of an earlier era. Liberal individual opinions do not depend on personal consideration, one's pain or pleasures, but on principled detachment from those pains and pleasures. The austerity of the new voting booth, and this is an, uh, admittedly not a great image, but it's the best I can do for you. This is the open polling of the earlier era, and down below is the new polling, and if you can see anything, you'll see in the center here a fireplace, and then you'll see 
the familiar looking little booths where people are voting on the right hand side. And then these are the officials. The austerity of the new voting booth depicts this sensuously personal deprivation. Sequestered as the voter is from festivities of polling days as well as the domesticities of home. In this regard, the balloting booth and box were presumed by their supporters to be magical machines that could induce a person to become a voter in possession of his own disinterested political opinions. Its isolation from others would enforce individuality, privacy, and an effect of self-possession. For who else but the voter alone in the booth could be responsible for the opinion expressed in the balloting booth? So take a moment to look at this remarkable image from a pro-ballot society pamphlet that visualizes much of what I am suggesting. The after image, the lower half, um, of this engraving is of course reasonably familiar to us modern Democrats who routinely vote behind curtains or walls or various barriers of one kind or another. Now, those of you who have been following me might well ask at this juncture why Mill, Arnold, and Elliot seem so derisive of the ballot and its so-called machinery if, in fact, it supported the empowerment of self-possessed opinion holders in charge of their impulses and passions. If the balloting booth enables individuality, surely Mill, of all people, would support it. If the balloting booth quelled public unrest and could calm the impulses and passions of human nature, surely Arnold, the lord of law and order, should be trumpeting its praises. If the balloting booth left the individual alone with his thoughts, surely Eliot, the mistress of the interior monologue, would champion it. What gives? So let us remind ourselves of our ensemble of quotations. What the ballot and the balloting booth promise is indeed the instantiation of the individual, but the individual on a massive scale in response to the million man extension of the franchise. This machinery of the ballot paradoxically aims to mass produce political individuality. To mass produce political individuality. And as Dickens shows us, machinery neither thinks nor produces thought, neither originates nor produces originality, but creates a world, to return to Dickens, inhabited, this is his quote, inhabited by people equally like one another, who all went in and out at the same hours, with the same sound upon the safe pavements, to the same work. In the modern world, where machines like computers dial other machines like phones and ask individuals for their opinions, which then are collated by other machines, calculators, and on and on and on, the tension between individual opinion and mass politics has perhaps significantly diminished, but I think not entirely. It may well be futile to try to recreate how impossibly new, potent, yet fragile, and thus unpredictable the era of opinion politics seemed to those first experiencing it. We may well be inured. Who were these million men who had never before mattered? And how could society individuate them so that mass opinion and mass revolution were evaded? How do we make them mindful of character? Felix's phrase, thoughts about water, if you recall, captures beautifully and all at once the intense political burden that individual, as opposed to mass opinion, was expected to bear. Opinion must be systematically thoughtful, indeed quasi-scientific, rather than impulsive. However, it must also be generated through the individual's thoughts, which, without the support of land, or lord, or landlord, seemed unbearably vulnerable, susceptible. These were the new individuals with opinions whose thoughts about water were worrisomely like water itself. They could evaporate, they could take on the shape of others. They could suddenly, inexplicably flow in the opposite direction. So indeed, much of the pathos of this mid-Victorian moment seems lost to us. However, I also believe there are a few features of this long ago historical period that might provide us with some contemporary insight. I don't fool myself. I'm not convinced there are a lot of insights for us in the story I've told, but I think there are a few. I take you back to 2008 when John Kerry was in a tight election fight with George W. Bush. Among a few other charges that seemed to stick to Kerry's detriment, there was the famous line, I was for the Iraq war before I was against it. You remember that? We could waste a few minutes pointing out that the quotation was rather unfairly taken out of context, but that isn't my goal today. 
I am interested in the political virtue it seemed to offend. The line, if you recall, became a slogan for what was deemed a fatal flaw in the candidate, his capacity to flip-flop in response to political breezes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now let's move ahead to 2012 and the campaign battle between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney. Surely everyone easily recalls the so-called 47% viral video that shows Romney revealing his disdain for those who do not pay income tax. As much as the video expressed a view unattractive to many voters and perhaps was also unfair in its framing, it staged to me a familiar dynamic where the public pronouncements of a candidate are shown to be the opposite of some more intimate or private self. Although it is certainly true that many voters developed reservations regarding John Kerry because they did not admire what at least appeared to be his changing opinion regarding the funding of the Iraq war. For the media and many Americans, the particular opinion he held mattered far less than that he changed it. If you don't like per Kerry's position on X, wait a minute, it will change. Likewise, although many reviled the condescension in Romney's chummy remark to the donors, for many it was a stain against his candidacy because it became exemplary of a tendency detected in him to espouse views in public that contradicted a private Mr. Romney. Here too, the emphasis is less on his views on income tax policy or even his feeling for the working poor, but as with Kerry, on a characterological failure. These, there are two interrelated but distinct characterological failures on display here, inconsistency and insincerity, and both ethical lapses matter to us to some degree, I would argue, because of the way that we have inherited a notion of mindful opinion from Victorian liberalism. Let me put it another way. Why do we care if Kerry changes his mind? Ought it matter if Mitt tells Ann Romney at home or his golfing buddies on the Greens that he can't stand half of America as long as he doesn't pass legislation that disables them? These criticisms of the candidate, please note, are not about the content of opinion, but about the form of its possession. We care tremendously about changes of mind in our candidates, and we worry inordinately about the relation between their private intention and public action perhaps far more than we do at times about the appropriateness of their policies. And we do in part because we think of our candidates as private characters with opinions who must adhere to their opinions in a certain way. In the pre 19th century political world, I have admittedly caricatured in this talk, individuals and their opinions had little to do with politics. By the middle of the 19th century, individuals and their opinions had everything to do with politics. But individuals were a brand new political entity that seemed bereft of authority in any familiar sense. If you recall, in place of authoritarian and traditional hierarchies of interest, in the Victorian mid-century, self-possession and disinterest were crucial factors in the individuation that held off a mass politics. Anthony Trollope, the savviest observer of Victorian politics and liberalism, has his exhausted eponymous protagonist, Phineas Finn, describe the self-reflexive rigors of this new standard. Speaking of one political issue, Phineas notes, on such subjects men must think long and be sure that they have thought in earnest before they are justified in saying that their opinions are the result of their own thoughts. This intense emphasis on qualities of an individual's mind and the consciousness of those qualities, rather than on performances of allegiance or force or interest in the public sphere, raised concerns about the relation between the private individual and possession of opinions and its operational and ethical relation to political action. Does a candidate mean what he says? Does a candidate do what he says? At times, the characterological charges launched against Kerry and Romney sounded quaint to me, indeed downright Victorian. At a moment in politics when a machine calls my machine to record my opinion, which in turn becomes a numerical droplet in a randomized national statistical ocean of data, it sometimes seems like the demanding of characterological stability and personal authenticity as conditions for political opinion is a benighted effort perhaps even a distraction. We live in a world in part formulated by Victorian liberalism. 
And to imagine a world without its ethical variety of individual opinion seems to many to usher in revolutionary turmoil, unsavory forms of communism, or dystopian nightmares. Even so, it still seems to me worth considering whether what has always been the tenuous, demanding, and unstable ethics of individual opinion should be central to the drama of a modern politics so thoroughly framed, constructed, and distributed by media and mediated representations of that opinion. Is it possible to reformulate opinion, even discrete opinion, without a characterological burden? Or must we attempt to introduce our own modern version of the balloting booth, a mechanism of sequestration that preserves some remnant of the mindful individual in the very thick of the mass-mediated political sphere? The melancholy madness of the machine, which is now the robocall, has certainly changed politics. What would Dickens say? Thank you.